Blog Talk Radio. Appreciate you for listening. You are the best listener on the planet. And I know we are hailing listeners all the way in Africa, from Ethiopia to South Africa, hopefully soon to be Ghana. Um, appreciate my African brothers and sisters over there. We are here. And also want to send some love to the Bangladesh uh, crew, India. We got some people out in UK uh, giving us some listens, as well as Australia. And surely, of course, everyone in the U.S., uh, as well as Canada, Mexico. Merci beaucoup. Uh, muy bueno. And um, we're going to learn some Indian uh, Patois languages and get that going. Saka fet tout aïe semwe, nou la, un la, na. We're making things happen. I was about to start talking in Creole. I got to get my Creole up. Um, appreciate you for listening, tapping in to Muscovy Media Podcast. And we are going to continue to present amazing, uh, inspirational guests, um, guests that know how to share different information on what got them where they're at, uh, as well as maybe some tribulations along the way. But uh, we will continue to uh, provide that for you uh, with no problem. And thank you to uh, for the people that listen to the past episodes. We got some great um, classics in our archives, so appreciate the listens that come from those episodes. Yet, uh, if you check some of our more recent uh, podcasts, you'll see that we have some amazing talent uh, that have been on the show. Uh, talent managers, agents, business people, uh, businessmen and women uh, so all from all over the world, and um, especially hailing out of uh, Los Angeles and Hollywood area, and um, you know spreading that love uh, as far as uh, sharing the different knowledge and um, the foundational pieces that can get you to where you need to be uh, to um, help you create that vision that you can actually materialize into real life. Um, Because, you know, we live in the American system, business is business, yet if you don't know how to participate in it, you will be left out in the cold. Now, there's so many ways to, uh, you know, take part in it, you know, getting your your business credit up, getting your personal credit up, um, 
you know, being able to apply for different grants, uh, you know, for your companies or whatnot, uh, you know, as well as, you know, just having a regular J-O-B, uh, wherever it may come and however it may come, uh, you know, don't let anybody uh, judge you for you making money and providing for your family or yourself, you know, it could just be you, you know, <laughs> sometimes people are just taking care of themselves, but uh, <clears throat> anyway, today we have an amazing guest on the line, uh, he is a singer, producer, writer, designer, also a uh, founder and creator of his own company, uh, Jason Ivy LLC, uh, so this guy is multi-hyphenated and fascinating uh, character and musician, and also he, uh, Jason Ivy, if you go to his website right now, jasonivy.com, uh, how it sounds is how it's spelled, uh, he is an acclaimed singer, songwriter, actor, music and film producer and director from the south side of Chicago, who has been featured in different uh, publications such as Self Magazine, Billboard, Next so Showcase USA, Chicago Sun-Times, and Reverb Nation as a top 10 artist. Jason comes to the industry, entertainment industry with an educational background in cognitive neuroscience and linguistics from the University of Pennsylvania and fluency in several languages. Um, during my time at uh, Philadelphia University, I definitely got to spend some time uh, with different people and friends at UPenn, a uh, really, really nice school, amazing. Uh, it also has a sports culture as far as allowing high school students to go to the Penn relays or whatnot. Uh, so that school is definitely on and popping. And for him to uh, take away from the, the cognitive and neuroscience and linguistics and apply it to uh, hip hop and or music or R and B and music and um, and also business is uh, definitely uh, different and smart. <clears throat> you are in college uh, for something that you feel uh, is something you like or enjoy. Um, definitely keep doing that, as you also can uh, you know. But if you need feel the need to leave college, that's also an option for some people that it, it doesn't feel right. Uh, getting back to Jason, in 2019, he won the John Lennon Songwriting Contest as a finalist for R&B in his first EP project, Compliments, which was nominated for Best R&B and Soul Album in 2020 for the We Are the Music Makers Awards. Jason's goal is to build platforms that allow for the restoration and application of routinely marginalized voices while active, actively empowering underserved and underrepresented communities. Jason is currently working on a 2021 debut album yeah. release. Um, see people wanting to message me while I'm on the air, but uh, my man Jason's on the line. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Uh, doing good uh over here in the u.s on the east coast uh are you working out of chicago or are you in la i'm in chicago i'm in chicago um but some of my team is in la um but i think that just being in um just being in my hometown is like helping me with my creative process right now definitely bringing it back home going back home and um restore helping restore that chicago energy that's definitely a good thing and that's amazing. Definitely. Um, definitely. Um, you are, uh, it says, you say that you are, you know, looking to empower and underserved, underrepresented communities. Um, I know Chicago, you know, parts of it can be considered that. Um, what do you see going in, going on in Chicago, um, you know, as far as the community and, and the, the youth? Um, and how are you looking to, um, you know, help that community out since that's your hometown? Yeah, I mean, so I grew up on the southwest side of Chicago. Um, I also went to high school in one of the rougher parts of the city uh, called Inglewood. And uh, at the time, you know, the statistics were you had a one in six chance of, you know, pretty much not making it home um, every time you stepped foot into that community. Um, so th those are the, the odds that I was sort of battling as I was trying to educate myself on 
what our other issues were that we were dealing with, you know, joblessness, homelessness, um, increasing poverty levels. It's just so many things that are plaguing my community. Um, So I figured that with my education and my artistry, I could probably offer um, a few ways to at least educate some people out of that situation. And beyond that, I could also offer them some opportunities to work with me um, and then also just be an example of what you can do, you know, basically when you have access to these these spaces. And I know that not everybody has that access. So I figured as many spaces as I can get access to, I could also let some people in with me. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to work with as many, you know, well-known, many talented people from the city as I can, um, as many eager people from the city as I can, and just put them in positions to just defy the odds that are put against them. Definitely, definitely. Um, having been born in a uh, Newark, New Jersey uh, area myself, uh, which is another um, statistical uh, community in which it uh, is comparable to the likes of maybe a Chicago or um, Oakland or something like that, um, mm-hmm. as well as Camden uh, in New Jersey is pretty bad as well. But having come out of that and uh, being able to represent uh, for my fellow brothers and sisters um, usually as the only, you know, black person in the room a lot of the times, um, it's definitely important for me to, to give it back. And I see that's something that you want to do uh, as well. Um, having uh, gone to UPenn, um, which is kind of in the middle of uh, Philadelphia, was it a mm-hmm. type of a culture shock for you at all? Or well, how did you enjoy the city of brotherly love? Because I spent time there at Philadelphia U. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I figured you had probably been to the city as well if you grew up in uh, the New Jersey area, because you all are pretty much, I mean, you're you're a bridge away. Um, and I feel like my time in Philly, it actually wasn't very different from my time in Chicago. I realized that the cities are very similar, and the, the things that make them so similar is the presence of people of color. Um, the same types of marginalization and cultural imperialism are happening in both cities. Um, you know, you have a lot of poverty, you have a lot of, you know, basically lack of access to a lot of things, but you have a lot of access to disparity in these cities. Um, so going there and expecting to see, you know, a campus that's thriving and a campus that's giving access to a lot of students that are coming from various backgrounds, I was a little bit disappointed um, just finding out that, you know, they had pretty much carved out a bubble of the city that was full of access, but as soon as you step beyond the bounds of the campus, uh, you would start to see that that unity kind of fall apart. And then taking a closer look, I started to realize that people in the neighboring communities didn't necessarily like my school. You know, it's it's sort of the case of the U Chicago in Chicago. How in U Chicago Hyde Park, and they're just they're buying up real estate in Hyde Park. They're neighboring into other areas like Woodlawn. Um, South Shore, even they're they're getting <laughs> really far beyond the bounds of uh, East Chicago's campus, and they're taking up a lot of real estate and a lot of space from communities of color. And I feel like Penn was doing the exact same thing in Philly. Uh, so whenever I would wear regalia or paraphernalia off of campus, uh, I would get some mixed looks. You know, the the white people would look at me like, okay, you know, you're not a threat to me. I understand that. You know, you're sort of assimilated into my society. You're, you're, you're at an Ivy League school, despite your physical appearance. Um, but then the people of color would look at me and be like, you're part of the problem, you know. So it would just be it'd be interesting whenever I went anywhere in the city. Wow. Uh, wow, that's amazing. Um, the difference is uh, to be able to experience that just walking around. Um, and there's a lot of uh, different uh, campuses all around Philadelphia, not just UPenn. Um, there's Drexel, um, there's a uh, Temple, uh, there's mm-hmm. the University of Arts, um, there's South Street, um, as well as yeah. yeah, Philadelphia University, which changed its name to Thomas Jefferson University uh, a couple years ago. Um, that's in the suburbs, like Northeast uh, Maniok area. Uh, so you know, mm-hmm. there's a there's a lot of different schools um, taking properties and uh, looking to expand the universities because they're you know they feel you know they're places of higher learning, 
or whatnot, and it'll bring back to the city, um, which the college students in Philadelphia, I'm sure, bring a lot of money um, to these um, areas, whether they're white areas or underprivileged areas. Um, yet, uh, we all do know about the gentrification that's also going on as well that's not allowing Blacks to participate in the expansion, which, you know, is part or uh, most of the issue or whatnot. Um, when it comes to your music um, and uh, actually getting into these different contests and, and winning them and getting critical acclaim, um, how did your uh, cognitive neuroscience and linguistics degree um, background educationally um, complement that? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of just wanted to, um, in college, study something that would allow me to relate better to the people around me. Um, so cognitive neuroscience just allows you to understand, you know, thought processes, um, mental states, emotion, motivation, and generally people's reasons for doing uh, the things that they do um, and the biological basis that kind of underlies just interaction with the world around you. Uh, then taking it into linguistics, that basically gives you the groundwork to communicate that, you know, um, whether it's different dialects, different um, ways of speaking across ice glasses, um, you're just equipped with the tools you need to talk to different people. Um, and that could be even within the same language. You know, people in Philly talk differently than people in Chicago. There's different slang that's used. Um, so that that awareness kind of offered me the um, – just the ability to be adept in any social, uh, social situation. So like when I'm writing my music, I sort of, I, I, re I weave a lot of stories into, you know, what, what I'm creating. And a lot of times it's not immediately apparent that that's what I'm doing. And you might realize on maybe the third or fourth listen, like, oh, there's actually a second narrative that's being told within this song, or maybe even a third narrative that's being told within the song. And that's sort of like what I wanted to do with my art is have it be multidimensional. Every time I release anything, it's never just face value. You know, it's, it's always something else that you can look deeper into because typically that's what the world around us is made up of. You know, it's something that you look at and then maybe four or five years later you revisit it and you're like, oh my God, how did I miss that? You know, so that's kind of, kind of what I wanted to bring to people's attention. Um, and I, I think that that's what people are starting to realize about my art and, you know, what's kind of like garnering that, that acclaim that you mentioned is people just sort of tapping into that second, third, or fourth narrative that I'm presenting them, you know, something that is a little bit different than the mainstream music and, you know, talking about money, talking about women, talking about, you know, uh, success, cars, et cetera, the, just the material thing. I really want to talk about life, life at its roots. Uh, definitely. As do so many people um, as a, person that studied philosophy and history, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to life that people may not be getting out of just uh, common regular day music and uh, music like yours that uh, takes, you know, intakes different levels of uh, life or whatnot or experiences um, will, should be theoretically relatable to a lot of people um, since, you know, while everyone's going through their unique experiences um, as a global community, um, we all, you know, usually want similar things in life um, that usually revolve around being happy or uh, resources or whatnot. Um, but to obtain those and to actually uh, really thoroughly be happy, one does have to uh, take time to study and learn about themselves. Um, so that's uh, definitely uh, pretty amazing uh that you uh, do that. Um, uh, so Thank you. you wouldn't consider yourself a like woke artist though, right? Uh, Cause there's so many different um, types of music out there, especially when it comes to like a Bob Marley or his, one of his kids, um, which can be almost like a spiritual soul type of music. Um, what would you categorize your music and what type of lane are you looking to, uh, you know, uh, take for yourself 
Yeah, no, I definitely wouldn't call myself a woke artist. I mean, there's a lot of like negative uh, stereotypes that come along with that. You know, people typically call themselves woke artists. They ascribe themselves that title. Um, and then oftentimes they'll talk about things that they don't fully comprehend. Like they'll try to talk about anything and everything that's pressing, anything that's like on trend, you know, blowing up in the media. They're like, oh, we got to talk about this. Like, Let me write a song about, you know, the, the protests that are happening. Like, the Black Lives Matter movements, or let me talk about, like, you know, xenophobia, and let me talk about, like, the LGBT movement, and, and then typically people aren't even involved in these communities, but they always have to find something to speak on, and it, it kind of becomes, like, a competition for relevance. It's like, how many topics can I talk about within my career, um, or the stories change, then let me add my perspective to it every single time, and I don't, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be taking up real estate in, in different spaces, you know, that, you know, some, some of them I don't belong to, some of them I do belong to. I just don't want to take up real estate and take away from actual conversations that are happening. I'd rather contribute to that in a meaningful way, help people process that, you know, sort of digest what's, what's actually going on in the world around them. Um, and then by that, I wouldn't even give myself a genre. You know, I, a lot of people would say, oh, you're R&B, oh, you're Neo Soul, oh, your music sounds like it was actually made you know, in the 70s or in the 80s or like, you know, maybe have I heard the song? What, what artist is this? Like, are you playing me like a, a classic song right now? And I'm like, no, this is what I wrote like two days ago. You know, like this is this is the music of today and, and the future uh, as far as I see it. And it's not typically what people are making these days, especially the stuff that's on my uh, upcoming album. It's going to sound a lot different from what you're hearing um, in most places, like in 99% of places that you're, you're finding music. Um, but I wouldn't want to even give it a genre, you know, to make it palatable. Maybe I would say in the vein of R&B, um, something that's like mellow, something that's chill, something that's not going to like raise your blood pressure while you're listening to it. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I definitely wouldn't want to give it any tags. I'd let the listeners and the audience sort of decipher that for me. You know, I feel like it's art. You don't want to give too many parameters for the stuff that you're giving your audience. You know, you want to let them digest it through their own lens, their own eyes, their own experience, because that's what art is meant to do. You know, it's meant to be a vehicle to take someone through an experience rather than just like here and now, look at this one exact topic, um, take away from it this and this, um, not this and that. You know, it means this. You don't want to give them all of that, all that information. You want them to find that out for themselves. Yeah, it definitely makes a lot of sense. Um especially as um, music continues to evolve and change uh, every day. And um, artists from the past are, you know, looking to create even new music using new sounds, while um, artists today are looking to sample and test out um, different types of music either from the past or looking to create new types of interesting sounds and creations. Um, you, um, you know, also speak different languages um, is that something that you are looking to also incorporate in your music in the future as well? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, the languages that I have at my disposal are uh, Spanish, German, and then sign language, even though it's not a spoken language. It definitely should be, I mean, it shouldn't even be classified as a foreign language because it's an American language, right? Um, but I feel like just having access to those gives me access to other conversations that you know, we may not be immediately part of. Um, and definitely one day I want to write songs in Spanish. I actually have been, uh, but I want to record those. I want to record songs in German. And I definitely want to incorporate ASL into my music videos to make it even more accessible to the communities that, you know, could enjoy this art. I feel like art, art has a lot of boundaries, you know, inherently. Um, but if the more that we take those down, the better it would be for just everybody else in society too, not just those targeted communities. Yeah, definitely. And um, that's interesting that you point that out. Um, it, it is called American Sign Language over here. Um, yet different hand gestures or whatnot might, and obviously different languages um, will, will change the sign language um, in different parts of the world, uh, potentially, or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which is very interesting. Um, for those that aren't really aware what um, cognitive neuroscience or linguistics is, 
um, I, I am a little bit um, from my own studies, but for those that aren't really aware of what that actually is, um, like what is cognitive neuroscience and um, linguistics? Okay, yeah. Um, so by technical um, terms, cognitive neuroscience. So neuroscience is just the study of the brain. Uh, and then cognition, which is, you know, the more uh, widely used version of cognitive. Cognition is just um, awareness, mental capacity, um, and basically pertains to all of your mental faculties. So it's about thinking, thinking using your brain. Uh, so together, cognitive neuroscience is the study of how people use their brains. Um, and then if you're looking at a modern context, what are the applications that come along with that? You know, uh, can you use cognitive neuroscience in education in the classroom? Can you use it to teach a, a young person, a young child? So that would be um, early childhood education. Um, can you use it in warfare? Yeah, you can. Uh, so there's actually a lot of uh, technical applications for cognitive neuroscience that are available. And then linguistics would just be the study of language. Um, so that could be, you know, English versus Russian versus Hawaiian pidgin. You know, you're looking at whole languages. You're looking at dialects. You're looking at pidgin. You're looking at patois. Um, you're looking at various levels of language. And then you're also looking at um, the same, same language and how it differentiates across different borders. So, you know, people in the South speak English differently. They use different words to mean different things that, in Chicago, you'd be like, what are you even talking about, you know, right now? Um, or <laughs> the, the accent or the drawl is, like, completely different. So they may be saying the exact same words as you, but you may not be attuned to hearing it said that way. So you're missing out on half of the sentence. Um, so those are just some of the examples of cognero and linguistics. And, yeah, like I, like I mentioned earlier, they're just kind of tools, both of them, um, that you can use to understand human populations a little bit better. Right, right. <clears throat> um, the, as far as like the macrocosm, um, but uh, as far as micro tools that you use every day in your life, um, are there any examples that you can point out um, or methods or activities that you do to make sure that, you know, cognitively you're on point or any linguistic um, exercises you may do that help you with music or speech or, or talking better or understanding better? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so I would say that something that I employ on a daily kind of microscopic level uh, when it comes to language, I'll say first, um, is just the old debate, the old notion of like being descriptive versus being prescriptive when it comes to language. So uh, and that translates to my art as well. Am I looking at the world around me and sort of being a note taker and a scribe to what I'm seeing and helping people to process what's actually happening? Or, and, th and that's called descriptive uh, linguistics, or am I looking at what people are saying and policing it in a way where it's like, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not historically correct. That's not historically accurate. You're not pronouncing that word correctly. You're, you're changing the meaning of that. Um, that phrase doesn't mean what you think it means. Don't say it that way. Um, you know, not really allowing for evolution and growth within language, and that would be prescriptive linguistics. So on a daily basis, I try to monitor what my interaction with language and, like, the way that I'm communicating with people around me, my family, my friends, um, how I'm communicating with them, and then also how I'm creating art. And is my art being reflective of what, what I'm seeing, or is it sort of stuck in the past and not evolving and by, by sort of by association, not allowing my audience to evolve as times change. So that's something that I sort of do every day in terms of linguistics. Uh, and then cognitively, um, I think that a lot of like daily practices with cognitive neuroscience kind of boil down to human psychology. You know, how, how do you as a person relate to people around you? You know, am I being manipulative? And I feel like as someone who has studied, like, actual manipulation, like, techniques, um, psychological techniques that can persuade others, um, you know, telltale signs, you know, basically reading emotion based on one's um, responses, their emotions, how they're looking on their face, even just, like, very basic levels of human emotion and psychology. 
I feel like I could employ those in a negative way. You know, I could sort of notice that someone is not taking the message that I'm receiving uh, correctly and steer the conversation in an entirely different way. Um, so I try to monitor that as well. Um, and that's something like from a course that I took called Judgment and Decisions, you know, like being a high self-monitor, you know, because I'm a very social person, I am prone to look at my actions like very, very, you know, rigorously and like monitor myself and be like, hmm, okay, like how am I coming off right now? Um, did that person take what I'm saying the correct way, the intended way? Um, should I reel this conversation in, switch lanes? And sometimes it almost borders on, you know, persuasiveness, persuasive tactics, but I try to look at what I'm doing with intention, speak with intention, move with intention, create my art with intention so that that doesn't happen. So even if I know how to, by the book, you know, persuade people, I want to give them the chance to make those decisions on their own. So that's kind of going back to what I was talking about with art, you know, just like giving my audience the tools that they need to digest what's going on around them, but not necessarily guiding them in any particular way. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and the music is definitely one of your um, amazing tools that you're uh, providing to the people or whatnot. And uh, when that album comes out, I uh, definitely would uh, love to play it on the podcast or whatnot. Um, that would be great. Um, as you are working on your um, debut album release, uh, did you have a title for it yet? Or I do. I do have a title for it. Um, it's a really long title, so I won't say the, the whole thing, but the shorthand is This Road Divided. And it's sort of, honestly, it, it's kind of very on brand with the conversation that we've been having. It's, you know, maybe you're presented in life with a couple different paths, and you have to, you have to be the person that's deciding the direction of your life. And then uh, in that vein, you're also deciding the direction of people around you, um, their lives. So, uh, yeah, it's called This Road Divided. And it's 10 songs long. And um, honestly, I, I thought I finished it, you know, a, a couple of years back, um, writing, recording, mixing, mastering. And I've been working on just release strategy. Um, but then about a month or two ago, I started revisiting it and listening to it over and over um, as I do. And I got some different featured artists on there from the Midwest, from L.A., from, you know, New York, et cetera. And then I figured, you know, I might as well rework the entire project to sort of fit into that descriptive uh, linguistic uh, mindset, not being prescriptive, sort of bending with what's happening these days. So I want to incorporate more of my communities, you know, be more intentional, be um, more responsible with what I'm saying. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of what, I, what I've been doing with my project. And it's being reworked from, like, the ground up. Uh, it still has all the same qualities as it did as when I recorded it the first time. But um, I'm giving more access, especially to my Chicago community in this next, like, iteration of the project. So when it's all said and done this time, I feel like I will be 300% more confident in the project's success and also in the messaging that it's given off. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, you got to get my homeboy, uh, Gary L. Gray, on there. Um, the, he was in our Cosby show, but he's from, from Chicago as well. Um, but he's a cool cat. Um, I don't think he does music, but um, he's a cool actor. Um, he would probably definitely want to support your project of uh, being a fellow uh, Chicagoan <laughs> or whatnot <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, but uh, again, yeah. thank you. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I definitely will. Um, but again, thank you so much for uh, stopping by the podcast and uh, tapping, with, tapping in with us and sharing some or basically just being a good example to others out there, especially those in your own community of what can be done um, when the odds and the statistics are seemingly against you um, as a melanated young uh, brother of African descent or whatnot. Um, again, it's an honor to have you here. Um, and uh, thank you so much. And hopefully uh, this album comes out ASAP so we can be blessed with it. Um, but either way, uh, you're the man, and keep doing your thing, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you so much for having me here and, and just giving me this space to connect with not only my audience but your audience as well. 
uh, and those, I think that when artists come together like that, it, um, it does what art was meant to do, you know, connect people across different boundaries and just open up different perspectives and definitely very grateful for that. And yeah, like I, I feel like the features in the album will be done in less than two weeks at this point. So once it's uh, remastered, um, yeah, I'll be dropping it immediately. Oh, that's awesome, man. And everybody can find you on uh, iTunes and um, you also have a SoundCloud page as well. And um, uh, for the people that want to reach out to you and connect with you, uh, where can they find you, brother? Yeah, so um, you can find me on all digital streaming platforms as Jason Ivy. That's J-A-S-O-N-I-V-Y. Um, and then on all social media as the Jason Ivy. So just add a the to the front of it and I should pop up. Yeah. Word up, word up. And there you have it. Thanks again, Mr. Jason Ivy, the man out of Chicago doing his thing. Uh, you, thanks again, uh, brother man. Um, and to our listeners out there, uh, there you have it. Please definitely uh, go to his website and all his social media. Um, he, he has some great, great music on his SoundCloud right now, a uh, matter of fact. And you can tune in and, and tap into that and uh, follow all his socials. And also, everybody, uh, be sure to check out our sponsor, Dancing in Life. Uh, definitely want to mention them. Uh, their website, um, go to my uh, Instagram and you can uh, check that site out. Um, my Instagram is Instagram.com slash Vmuscova and Dancing in Life. Uh, basically, um, a, a fellow put this program together to bring dancing and to help people uh, emotionally uh, distraught, utilize movement to uh, release endorphins and feel better and uh, also uh, team up with people around the globe um, in Dancing and Life program. So y'all can check that out, my family, all around the globe, from Chicago to Newark to Woodbridge to India, uh, Bangladesh and uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, Australia, all different listeners. Um, thank you so much uh, for listening and sharing and uh, complimenting the episode. And uh, go rate the episode. Uh, we got some good five-star rating so far. And... Um, you know, definitely go rate the, uh, give us more five star ratings, and you can find us on pretty much everywhere, uh, like iTunes, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, uh, Google Podcasts, as well as many, many more. If you want the full info, just go to my Instagram.com/slashvmuscova, and you can check out all the links, uh, or you can go to our website, muscovaenterprises.com/links. And uh, you will get it on popping. So thank you, everybody. And we are out. <laughs>